Okay, folks, welcome to another session of uh, PHI 215. Uh, we are getting started on our last week of the course. Um, and we are uh, getting started on our class vote topic for today, uh, which is uh, race and gender. Uh, so y'all were interested in looking at these questions about how to think philosophically about what race is and what gender is. Uh, so we are going to look at a couple of papers, uh, one on the topic of race uh, by Quayshawn Spencer, uh, and then we're going to look at a paper on gender uh, by Elizabeth Barnes. Uh, and we're going to get a feel for uh, you know, just the, the sorts of issues that uh, philosophers are thinking about and worried about uh, when it comes to uh, making sense of what gender is and what race is, if they're anything. You know, so we are doing metaphysics here. Uh, much like we were doing metaphysics when we were thinking about uh, the nature of the mind or uh, whether free will exists. Well, uh, we can ask similar metaphysical questions. Remember, these are just questions about what the nature of reality really is. Uh, whether we should uh, include things like race and gender uh, in our overall picture of reality. Um, and we might also ask the question like, if we're going to include race and gender in our overall picture of reality, uh, what are these things going to look like? Uh, so those are the sorts of questions we're going to be dealing with when we look at uh, Spencer's paper and Barnes's paper. So uh, here are just a few possible views in the philosophy of race, uh, and they're hinted at in Spencer's title. You know, he is asking, are folk races like dingoes, dimes, or dodos? So, uh, here are some possible ways of going. So one way to think about what race is and what it really is, is the view that uh, we should actually get rid of the concept of race because there are in fact no races. So whenever you attribute a race to somebody, you're speaking falsely, right? Uh, it would be sort of like talking about magic or fairies, uh, assuming that magic and fairies aren't real things. Uh, well, we would say that like every time we speak about magic and fairies uh, in a positive way, not like in a nice way, but whenever we make positive assertions about magic and fairies, we're always uh, going to be saying something that's not true. Uh, so Spencer says that uh, if you're an eliminativist about race and people like Kwame Anthony Appiah are people like this, uh, they're going to say that uh, you're always speaking falsely because there are, in fact, no races. So Spencer says that this is kind of like the view that races are like uh, dodos, right? Uh, an extinct bird. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we might also imagine like some sort of like imaginary bird that never existed. Uh, that might even be closer to the view. But the idea is that it is something that isn't actually present in the world. Another approach to thinking about race is to say that race is something that's socially constructed. Uh, so it's the idea that being a member of a certain race is a complex array of social properties. Uh, so the thought here is that being a member of a race, so for me to be a white person, uh, is for me to inhabit or instantiate uh, a complex array of social properties. And the thought here is that a dime is kind of like race, if we take this social construction view, because what a dime really is, is really only explicable or understandable when we understand the broader uh, social array of money exchange. Uh, so it's not just a piece of metal, uh, you know, made of nickel, dimes, made of nickel or 
silver or whatever they are, uh, you know, like a circular piece of silver, uh, until we understand that uh, the way that people see and understand dimes uh, makes them what they are is when we understand what they really are. So the thought is, uh, maybe the institution of certain social conventions and certain social practices and perceptions are what make it the case that you have a certain race, uh, much like certain thoughts and perceptions make it the case uh, that a dime is what it is. And the last possible view uh, we might call realism about race. Um, and this is the idea that uh, being a member of a race is something that is true of people, so it's not like a limitivism, but it's true of people in a way that isn't like social constructionism. So it's not a complex array of social properties, it's a fact that uh, exists whether or not we believe in it. Uh, so the idea is, like a dingo is a dingo, whether or not people believe in it. You know, it's a certain species of animal, and that's something that exists independently of and prior to any social arrangements. Uh, and this is going to be the view, realism about race. Uh, Spencer is going to work on defending a version of that view. So here is Spencer's argument that race is a real, uh, non-socially constructed uh, category in the world. He says, first, human continental populations are real biological entities. Two, human continental populations are folk races. So three, his conclusion, folk races are real biological uh, entities. I've actually got a typo there, so I'm going to go in and fix it. Uh, it should say entities right there. So the thought is uh, folk races are real biological entities, uh, much like uh, concepts of things like species are real biological entities. Uh, now, uh, just to clarify some points in Spencer's argument, when he says folk races, what he's talking about is the kinds of races that are talked about in ordinary language. Um, and as he'll clarify later in his argument, he's not saying that every kind of race talked about in ordinary language is a real race. Um, so he points out that there might be some racial categorizations of people uh, that don't correspond to uh, these real biological concepts, well then those aren't real races. Uh, but there are at least some folk races, um, like uh, referring to someone's race as black or African, or referring to somebody as white or Caucasian, or as Asian. Uh, these are the kinds of things we're talking about when we talk about folk races. Uh, you know, Spencer also points out that there might be a uh, disagreement about exactly uh, which people count as white people. Uh, so in many categorizations that will include Hispanic people, or it will include uh, Jewish people, uh, whereas, uh, say, members of the Ku Klux Klan uh, would claim that those people aren't really white. Uh, but just because some people speak mistakenly about these races, um, or simply because uh, there's disagreement about where the boundaries are, that doesn't mean uh, that the concept isn't a concept referring to something real in the world. It just means that there's disagreement about it. Uh, another uh, concept here is that of a real biological entity. Uh, so Spencer says that a biological entity is a thing whose essence consists of biological qualities in whole or part. Uh, 
So when we're talking about essence, basically we're saying is the features that make a thing what it is. Uh, so for instance, earlier in the semester, we noticed that Descartes pointed out to us that the essence of material objects is extension, taking up space, right? Or he said that the mind, its essence is thought. So when we're talking about biological entities, we're talking about things uh, that consist in biological qualities. So the idea here then is eventually that a folk race, uh, you know, being white or being black or being Asian, uh, those are real biological qualities, according to Spencer. And then he goes on to clarify that a biological entity is real if carefully, careful biology has determined that that entity actually exists. So now we want to know, uh, we need to establish that there are uh, human continental populations uh, so, the study of population is important in biology, especially in the study of evolution. And Spencer points out that there was a research breakthrough about 20 years ago uh, that using software, population membership could be graded. So the idea is, uh, when you have a population of a species, sometimes certain groups within that population uh, might start tending to breed with one another. Um, and in some cases, you'll even get populations breaking off from one another completely, uh, like in this chart. Uh, and sometimes you get populations that sort of intermingle, but then they also have uh, like predominant uh, groupings together uh, in terms of things like genetic similarity. Uh, now, there's sort of like a phase that gets you from one homogenous population uh, where genetic material is shared equally or at random between all the species and ones where you have distinct uh, islands uh, where interbreeding happens. Uh, and that these new advances in computing allowed biologists to sort of talk about a particular individual animal as, say, in between uh, different large groupings of population. So you could have an animal being like 40% a member of one population and 60% of another, and so on. Uh, so there are multiple levels of population subdivision. So this is what's going on here. So that's one population. This is like a heavily subdivided population that's a less intermediately subdivided population. Uh, so one of the ways of breaking up our categories of human uh, population subdivisions is in terms of continental population. So there's, say, like an American continental population, a European, an African, and an Asian, and also uh, in Pacific Island, uh, oceanic uh, population grouping. Uh, so basically you would have uh, something like this with like five different categories and a certain amount of um, interbreeding uh, between different populations, uh, but there are broad genetic similarities uh, within each of them. And uh, so what Spencer is pointing out here is that these continental populations are themselves uh, real biological entities, that they are uh, quantifiable uh, using uh, legitimate methods of biological research. And then he further points out that human continental populations are themselves uh, what he calls folk races. Uh, so he points out that the U.S. Office of Management and Budget has official race categories, and these categories are sometimes referred to as OMB racists, Office of Management and Budget races. And the categories are 
uh, American Indians, Asians, Blacks, Pacific Islanders, and Whites. Uh, so the idea is you can belong uh, to more than one OMB race at once. Uh, so there's nothing that keeps a person from, say, qualifying genuinely as both a black person uh, and a white person at the same time, right? Uh, but everybody's going to belong to at least one category. Um, so any human being is going to fall into at least one of these populations. And uh, Spencer has also pointed out that genetic testing has shown that 99.9% uh, .9, uh, accuracy uh, can be had uh, when you compare genetic testing uh, with self-reported uh, reports of which OMB category a person falls into. Now, Spencer then raises an objection by another philosopher, Glasgow, who points out that there's something wrong with this strategy of identifying race with uh, genetic uh, continental populations. And the idea is this. Race terms are supposed to refer to what you look like. Uh, but uh, the concept of continental population is not a concept of what you look like. They have different meanings. It's the objection. Uh, and Spencer replies to this objection, this actually depends on how you think about the meaning of terms. Uh, so this is going to get us into a brief little foray into the philosophy of language. Um, and this is a really important debate uh, when philosophers argue about how we ought to think about the meanings of words. And it's a debate between descriptivism and referentialism. So descriptivism is the theory that the meaning of a name is determined by a list of superficial properties. Uh, so for instance, uh, like the meaning of the name George Washington uh, could be determined by a list of superficial properties, right? Things like was really tall, had wooden teeth, was the first president of the United States. Uh, so we understand what a name picks out uh, by thinking about all the properties that it connotes. Another example, you might think about what the word dog means or what the name dog refers to. You might think that the word dog means something like, you know, they are the four legged, they are the four legged furry friends. You know, who have tails that wag and they have wet noses. And that's uh, what we mean when we talk about the meaning of the word dog. Uh, but, and we might think that this sort of approach to understanding the meaning of a term might also help us to understand what a term like black or white uh, means when we uh, think about races. So the word black would uh, refer to uh, human beings with a certain uh, shade of skin who you know, often have brown eyes, uh, who have uh, a certain kind of hair texture, uh, and so on. Uh, and then for a term like white, it would say that, you know, people who have um, a certain shade of skin, uh, a certain texture of hair, uh, who tend to have different colors of eyes, so sometimes brown, sometimes blue, sometimes green or hazel, uh, and so forth. Uh, but that runs us into the problem uh, that we saw before, that uh, then it won't match with the concept of continental populations.
Right. And this is uh, where Spencer brings in uh, the referentialist uh, theory of the meaning of terms. So the meaning of a name is provided by the referent of a name. So to take the George Washington example again, the meaning of the name George Washington uh, is provided by uh, simply the guy, uh, whatever it might be the case uh, that is true about George Washington. So, you know, it might be the case that George Washington actually didn't have wooden teeth, that that was just a myth. Uh, but that doesn't change the meaning of the term because had wooden teeth is not built into the concept, according to the referentialist. Uh, so we could also do this with a name like dog, right? Let's say that dog refers to a specific species of animal, uh, you know, Canis lupus familiaris, which includes, for example, uh, you know, particular instances like Rover, Fido, and Bo. Uh, Bo is the name of my dog. Uh, so that might be uh, like a different way of approaching it. Uh, and what Spencer tells us is that we can think about races in these terms as well. So the name... Uh, you know, the term black, or the term Caucasian, uh, is going to refer to a specific continental population of human beings, uh, which then includes, like, specific individuals. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you know, uh, the term Caucasian uh, refers to a specific continental population, which includes, for instance, uh, you know, people like uh, George Washington or Bill Gates or uh, Dr. Goodine. Uh, uh, and then, you know, we could do that for any of the races and we would say that, well, uh, we've got these five main continental populations uh, and uh, they refer to uh, particular uh, individuals uh, or particular groups. Uh, who fall into uh, genetic classes with particular origins. Uh, so Spencer says that the OMB races actually have uh, a referential meaning, and the referential meaning uh, is traceable to uh, a certain referent, right? So being a member of uh, a certain uh, continental population. Uh, then he points out that, so for instance, uh, Melanesians are Pacific Islanders in terms of ancestry, and you know we can find this in terms of uh, genetic testing, uh, but their visible physical features are not superficially different uh, than those of Sub-Saharan Africans, that is, uh, black folks. Uh, so they have like similar texture of hair, similar eye color, similar skin tone, uh, but they are not of the same race, according to Spencer, because even though they might be uh, descriptively similar, uh, the referent of the term picks out uh, different uh, population, uh, continental population groupings for them. Uh, and it's this concept of population groupings uh, that is central in uh, Spencer's argument, uh, which leads him to think that uh, race is a concept that can be understood in terms of realism. So that's why he prefers realism instead of eliminativism or a social construction view. So some folk races, he doesn't say all folk races, but he says that some of them uh, correspond to human continental populations, uh, which are uh, real biological entities. Uh, so I'll leave it to you to think about whether this argument uh, makes any sense. You might think that actually uh, the fact that there are certain genetic population groupings actually doesn't actually prove that we need to talk about races. Uh, or we might begin to 
you know, start picking at the premises of Spencer's broad argument. Uh, you know, we might uh, start to wonder uh, whether these populations are, you know, real entities or whether they're simply um, useful tools for talking about uh, broad patterns uh, in populations. Uh, we might begin to ask whether uh, just because biologists talk about these entities, uh, does that mean that they actually exist uh, uh, independently of uh, the way that biologists think about them? So, you know, we might think about how uh, a blood chart is something that a biologist or a medical professional can read, uh, but it's not like uh, blood charts uh, in and of themselves um, are things that biology has to say actually exist in the same way that they say things like white blood cells actually exist. Uh, so I'll leave that to you to think about uh, ultimately uh, whether we want to take an eliminativist view, uh, a social construction view, or a realist view uh, about races. Uh, it's certainly not an easy question and there are certainly many philosophers who might uh, take issue with certain parts of Spencer's argument. Uh, but uh, I'll leave that to you to figure out uh, whether any good responses uh, can be made uh, in favor of an alternative to a realist view. Okay, well, thanks for listening in, and uh, I'll be in touch. All right. Bye.